Greetings in peace. I would like to start this with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim and Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I hope all of you and yours are having a wonderful month of April 2024 as we enter into the final days of Ramadan 2024 and head towards the Eid holiday. The presentation I would like to do is to talk about Henry Corbon's book, Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth, which I believe is one of the greatest books written on Sufism and Islamic mysticism. For those that follow Bobby Hemet, even Bobby Hemet will tell you to read this book if you're looking into Sufism. And I dedicate this to Sheikh Wahid Azal and the Nur Fatimiya Sufi order, as we hold Henry Corban in a high regard in our system. So first I'll talk a little bit about Henry Corban, who he is, a little summary of the book and his teachings, and then I will go full depth into the book and what it teaches. So thank you as always for joining me, and I hope you all benefit from this. So starting with Henry Corban, he was born in 1903, and he passed away in 1978. He was a prominent French philosopher, theologian, and scholar of Islamic mysticism, he is best known for his work on the Iranian philosopher Avicenna and for introducing the concept of the imaginal realm in Western philosophy. Korban's life was dedicated to bridging the gap between Western and Islamic thought, exploring the mystical dimensions of both traditions. He studied at the Sorbonne and later became a professor at the École Pratique des Hautes Etudes in Paris. His extensive writings have had a significant influence on the study of Islamic philosophy and mysticism in the West. Henry Corban's teachings centered on the exploration of mystical and spiritual dimensions within Islamic thought, particularly focusing on Shia Islam, Shiism, and the works of Persian philosophers like Avicenna, Ibn Sina, and Suhrwardi. Some key aspects of his teachings are as follows. 1. The Mundus Imaginalis Corban introduced the concept of the imaginal realm, or the Mundus Imaginalis, which he believed to be a realm of spiritual realities intermediate between the physical world and the world of pure intellect. This concept has had a profound impact on the understanding of symbolism, imagination, and spiritual experience in Western philosophy and psychology. 2. Theophany and Divine Imagination. Corban explored the idea of theophany or the manifestation of the divine through the lens of the imagination. He argued that the divine presence can be experienced through visionary encounters and spiritual imagination, emphasizing the importance of inner spiritual experiences and understanding the nature of reality. 3. The Spiritual Journey. Korban's works often discuss the spiritual journey of the soul, drawing from the Islamic mystical traditions such as Sufism. He believed in the transformative power of spiritual practices and inner contemplation in guiding individuals towards spiritual enlightenment and union with the divine. 4. Islamic Philosophy and Mysticism Korban's scholarship sheds light on the rich philosophical and mystical heritage of Islam, particularly within the Shia tradition. He emphasized the importance of understanding Islamic thought in its own terms and advocated for a dialogue between Western and Islamic philosophy. And Korban's teachings emphasize the importance of spiritual experience, imagination, and inner transformation in the quest for divine knowledge and understanding. His works continue to inspire scholars and spiritual seekers interested in exploring the mystical dimensions of Islamic philosophy and spirituality. Now that you know a little bit about him, now we can go right into his book, Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth. So in Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth, Henry Corban explores the concept of the imaginal world and its significance in understanding spiritual realities within the context of Islamic mysticism. He dwells into the teachings of the Persian philosopher Suhrwardi and his vision of the world of image as a realm where spiritual truths are manifested through symbols and archetypes. Korban discusses the transformative power of visionary experiences 
and spiritual imagination in transcending material existence and attaining union with the divine. He also examines the relationship between the earthly realm and the celestial spheres, exploring how the spiritual body can ascend to higher levels of consciousness and participate in the divine cosmology. Through his analysis, Korban offers insights into the mystical dimensions of Islamic philosophy and the role of the imagination in spiritual realization. Korban stresses the importance of forms and the imaginative faculty. The emphasis is there on the discipline required for the imagination to serve the intellect and the role of the imaginal body in spiritual experiences. The book explores the relationship between imagination, the mundus imaginalis, and the theophanies that are there. And it also continues to discuss the connection between prophecy and philosophy, as well as the concept of prophetic philosophy as a narrative philosophy. And it further dwells into the concept of tawil, T-A-W-I-L, and its role in the uncovering the true sense of events. Overall, the teachings highlight the significance of the imaginative power and the mundus imaginalis in spiritual and philosophical experiences. Korban discusses the concept of the Sophia, or divine presence, as a necessary intermediary between the transcendent deity and the world of man in various religious traditions. The exploration is there of the ideas of spiritual mediating entities and the struggle between different philosophical perspectives. Korban emphasizes the importance of the Sophianity or embodiment of Sophia in different forms and its significance in different belief systems. Additionally, Korban proposes the existence of an imaginal history distinct from material history that involves real events in a subtle world. Philosophy that loses connection with the imaginal world and history closes itself off from events and becomes prey to false dilemmas. A different vocabulary is required to understand the chronicles of Malakut and other spiritual experiences. Their search for the angelic world involves a forgotten tradition that needs to be renewed and understood through rigorous study. Access to this world is difficult and requires more than a single reading. The imaginal world should not be confused with superficial images in modern civilization. The lost continent of spirituality in Islam and Iran can only be understood by immersing oneself in their language and symbols. Korban discusses the contrast between the belief in the immortality of the soul and the resurrection of the dead. The book and its teachings argues that these beliefs are not a matter of theoretical proof, but rather a personal judgment one has of oneself. And it further explores the themes of Mazdian consciousness, Persian and Arabic literature, and the difficulties of approaching Islamic theology from all of these different perspectives. And the suggestion is there that a lack of adequate terminology hinders understanding of the subject matter. The book continues to discuss what Korban is saying, the concept of another world, known as the Harkalia, which cannot be perceived through ordinary knowledge. This world is a place where spiritual events take place and where the spiritual sense of written word and beings can be understood. Korban argues that understanding this other world requires a different perspective and a mode of understanding that they refer to as a progressio harmonica. And Corban suggests that the past is not fixed and completed, but rather constantly being reiterated in this other world. And it just explores the idea of a spiritual dimension beyond ordinary perception. The original figure on silk, discovered in 1925 in the hills near Ray, Iran, is believed to have been a precious material used for wrapping the body of a deceased person. It dates back to the 5th century and depicts the theme of ascent to heaven with a youth being carried by a bird. The bird is thought to be the Enki or Phoenix, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. This motif is also found in the paintings of the Palatine Chapel at Palermo, which were inspired by Iranian themes. The perception of the earth as an angel, as described by Fechner, is linked to Mazdian angelology 
and requires an intellectual faculty beyond abstraction and, sensor, and a sensory perception, it, it is a psychic event that occurs in an intermediate universe of arch, archetype images where the earth is encountered in the person of its angels. This angelogy is a characteristic feature of Zoroastri Zoroastrianism, Mazdaism, from that perspective. The Mazdian belief system cannot be reduced to monotheistic or polytheistic understanding. It is important to comprehend the cano canonical Avesta, particularly the Psalms of Zarathustra, in order to understand the spirituality of Mazdian devotion. Mazdian piety requires and recognizes the equivalent of Yazatas in angels and archangels, who are not servants or messengers, but rather figures similar to the De Angeli of Proclus, or Proculus. The Zoroastrian view of the world is a battle between the power of light and the counterpower of darkness, with no compromise or coexistence. The Lord Wisdom is surrounded by six powers of light, forming the divine heptad. These archangels are understood as active and activating energy that communicates being and it establishes it. Each archangel has their own hierarch hierarchical role in the creation and governance of different aspects of the world. Human beings are called to cooperate with these invisible powers of light for the salvation of the creational region. Corban discusses the concept of angelology in Mazdian cosmology, particularly focusing on the role of the angel of the earth and the relationship between invisible and visible realms. And he suggests that active imagination allows for the perception of these celestial figures and unveils hidden realities. The book also discusses the idea of the mystical earth and its importance in the spiritual teachings of Shakyism. The book discusses the concept of an energy referred to as a zavarna, or the light of glory that is present from the creation of the world until the final transfiguration. This energy is associated with eschatological hopes and is represented by a halo in iconography. It is the fundamental image through which the soul understands and perceives itself and its powers. The soul projects this image onto beings and things raising them to a state of incandescence. The imago terre, or the image of the earth, reflects and announces the soul's own image to the soul. The earth is perceived through its angel, and this perception is expressed in Mazdian angelology. The perception of the earth's mystery, called geosophy, requires visionary geography rather than positive geography. The ancient Iranians cartographical method shaped an instrument for med meditation that allowed them to mentally reach the center of the earth. And the book discusses the schema of the earth's surface, which is projected by the active imagination and is divided into seven realms. Corban discusses the division of demonic powers into seven Keshwars. The central Keshwar Zavanirata is the largest and surrounded by six other Keshwars. These Keshwars are not climates, but zones of land. The eastern Keshwar is called Sahavi. The western Keshwar is called Erazahi. And there are two Keshwars to the north and the south. The mythical ocean that surrounds them is called the uh, Vurukasha. These Keshwars are not based on actual geography, but are representations of celestial topography. The central Keshvar, Zanavirata, represents the land of Iran and is divided into seven regions. This method of representation allows for meditation and spiritual exegesis. And Korban also mentions the debates on the locations of Zarathustra's preaching, suggesting that it might have taken place in both the east and the west of the Iranian world. And the discussion is there on the concept of the falsification and identifying sacred places and the preservation of an essentially qualitative space. And Corban emphasizes that the identification of holy places does not rely on historical value, but rather on intrinsic qualification. And the book also mentions the presence of the center, which is the origin of spatial references and does not require a change in the system of spatial 
references. It further explores the events in Iran Veg, including liturgies and the building of the Var. The book suggests that the Yima's paradise cannot be marked on maps and requires achieving transparency to allow the archetype image to appear. And Corban discusses the Mazdian Imago Tarei and the role of the mountains as the seat of theophanies and angelophanies. The book explores the idea of perceiving the earth through the active imagination, which reveals a transfigured and symbolic earth. It discusses mountains and their significance as hierophanies or manifestations of the divine. The book also mentions the heavenly waters of Anahita and the white Hauma, which symbolizes immortality. It connects the mountain of dawn to eschatology and the crossing of the Chinvat Bridge which represents the soul's journey towards immortality. The book emphasizes that these perceptions go beyond empirical observation and are revealed through the figure of angels and the light of glory. Corban discusses the concept of the imago terre and the perception of the earth as an angelic vision. It explores the idea that the soul projects its own image onto the earth and discovers aspects of itself in the figures of feminine earth angels. The book also discusses the relationship between psychology and geography and how the soul's projection of nature shapes the physical landscape. Two examples are given, one involving the representation of the landscape of Zaverna and another involving the connection between flowers and angel symbols in Mazdian angelology. The book concludes with a discussion of the journey to the celestial earth and the hierophanic episodes that occur in relation to Zarathustra and his companions reaching the earth of visions. The book discusses Zarathustra's journey to the origin, the archetypal world, and crossing of the four branches of a river. It describes his encounter with the Archangel Bauman and his ecstasy in the presence of the Council of Archangels. The book also explores the connection between visionary geography and eschatology, as well as the concept of geosophy and the feminine angels of the earth. And Corban introduces Mazdian sophiology and the role of Spenta Armeti as the feminine archangel of the earth. Corban explores the Mazdian vision of the world and the relationship between feminine archangels and the earth. Corban emphasizes the importance of understanding and activating the personal characteristics of these archangels. The process of assuming spender mat matark or embodying the mode of being spenta armeti is discussed as well as the role of meditation and wisdom in this process. Corban also touches on the concept of the celestial earth and the role of the anima or the eternal feminine in human consciousness. The paradox of the human fravarti incarnating on earth is mentioned as well as the battle for the angel that the incarnate fravarti faces alongside other beings of light. The full understanding of these concepts is said to only be revealed after death. The Chinvat Bridge is an important concept in Mazdian religion, representing the passage of the soul to the afterlife. Deena, a, fig a figure similar to Sophia, stands at the entrance of the bridge and facilitates the passage for the soul. Deena is the visionary soul or organ of the soul, representing both the light that enables vision and the celestial figure that is seen. She is also the archetype and the judge of the believer's earthly existence. Deina has sisters, such as Chishti, who confers vision, and the Ashivanuhi, who possesses and bestows Zavarna, the light of glory. The meeting with Ashivanuhi prefigures the meeting with Deina on the Chinvet Bridge. The destiny of the soul is intertwined with the destiny of the earth, as the soul helps save the earth from demonic powers. The angel Ashtat reflects the transfigured image of the earth to the soul. The book discusses the concept of a final transfiguration event when all creatures will possess an incorruptible body of luminous fire. It explains that this event is the reason for the choice and battle of the Fravertis and that the creatures of light are currently working towards it. The book also explores the perception of the fire of earthly glory and its relation to spiritual fire and saving knowledge. 
It mentions the figures of the angel Arshtat and Zam Zamilt, who play a role in the judgment and weighing of the soul. The book then dwells into the mytho history of Gayomart and the creation of the first human couple, Mahriyag and Mariling, the concept of Adam and Eve by Spenta Armeti. It highlights the importance of the restoration of a dualitude through conjunction with the de with Dain Denel and the role of the Sessiant in rep representing the beginning, middle, and end of man and the world of man subjected to mixture. In short, the book discusses the concept of the Seoshant and the virgin birth, connecting it to the preservation of the gold from Geomart and Zarathustra's Aurora Gloriae. Korban also mentions the transfiguration of man and the earth and the role of Ardvi Sura Anahita and the Vispa Torveri in the process. Please forgive me if I'm mispronouncing these names. The book then explores the need for an intermediate world between pure physics and subject, subjectivity and the connection between Mazdi and Iran and Shia Tehran. It touches on the spiritual history of Iran, specifically focusing on the work of Suhrawardi and the ideas of the hidden Imam and the eschatological savior that all religions talk about. The book concludes by discussing the perception of things in Hurkalia and the concept of Tawil and understanding the different levels of being in this specific chapter. The book discusses the concept of Tawil, which is the hermeneutics of symbols and denotes the bringing out of hidden spiritual meaning. The practice of Tawil is necessary for Suhrawardi's oriental theosophy and Shiite gnosis, as it allows for the transfiguration of the meaning of Islam. Tawil relies on the existence of the world of Harkalia, which is the world of archetypal images that allow for the perception of inner meaning. The book also mentions the importance of Isfand Armuz, the angel of the earth, in Suhrawardi's teachings, which, is, which this is mentioned, the Tawil is a matter of hearing an identical sound on multiple levels simultaneously and requires harmonic perception. The book concludes on this specific chapter by discussing the presence of the feminine archangel represented by figures like Spenta Armeti and Fatima in the spiritual phenomena of Shiite Gnosis. The book further continues to discuss the little-known religion of Shriism in Iran and its connections to their resurgence of Gnosis in Islam. It highlights the importance of the conversations between adepts and imams in the development of Shriism. The book explains the division of prophetology and the imamology in Shiite theosophy and the role of the hidden imams. And the further discussion is there on the concept of the celestial earth and its significance in Shakyism. The chapter concludes by emphasizing the meta-historical nature of the origin of Islamic faith and the role of the primordial theophany. The order in which the spiritual entities answered the primordial in interrogation reveals the structure of the pleroma. The pleroma is created through theophanic acts that coincide with the differentiation of drops of the primordial ocean of being, the hierarchy of the 14 supreme spiritual entities, including the Prophet Muhammad and the 12 Imams, will have its epiphany on earth. The first spiritual entity to answer is the Prophet Muhammad, followed by Imam Ali, and then the 12 Imams. Fatima completes the pleroma and is considered the earth, of the supreme pleroma. Fatima is also associated with Logos and Sophia and is the manifestation of an internal Sixzi. She is the soul of the Imams and the source of qualification and meaning in the universe. The book in this specific chapter discusses the ontological rank and significance of Fatima Sophia in relation to the Imams and the universe. And it emphasizes her role as the manifestation of the creative principle of the world and the source of knowledge and power for the prophets. Fatima Sophia is described as the soul and the feminine archetype, ruling over all the earths and the existing before them. Her functions symbolize initiation and theophany, and she is characterized as a sovereign of fem feminine humanity.
The book also draws connections between Fatima Sophia and the Mazdian earth and the concept of the Spendermat. The relationship between Muhammad, Fatima, and the hidden Imam, as well as Zarathustra, the mother of the last Seoshant, and the, la and the last Seoshant, as explored in, Shiite, in Shriite Iranian literature. Shriite theologians have direct knowledge of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible and Zoroastrianism eschatology. Homolog homologations are made between a Zoroastrian hero and the hidden Imam Resurrector. This mode of thought involves thinking in cycles and perceiving a constant structure. The progression is not a horizontal linear evolution, but an ascent from a cycle to cycle. The oriental origin is the celestial pole, the cosmic north, which orients and magnetizes the return and the reascent. The paradise of Vierna and the earth of light are situated in the north. Fatima Sophia is the sup supra-celestial earth and the anima of the supreme pleroma. The, hid the hidden imam lives in the earth of Hurkalia. The paroesia of the hidden imam is a gra gradual disoccultation. In the world of Hurkalia, the evaded imam is present. The spirituality of Shriism is based on this concept, which can be understood by reading the writings of Sheikh Sarkar Aga. The historian Tarbal provides information about the earth of the emerald cities, where three cities, including Herkalia, are situated. These cities are described as perfect, and inhabitants have no knowledge of Adam or Iblis. The mountain of Kaf, which surrounds the universe, is also mentioned as the boundary between the visible and invisible worlds. To reach, the city, to reach these cities hidden beyond the mountain, the mystical pilgrim must pass through darkness and face challenges. The mountain of Kaf is also associated with the cosmic pole and the celestial rock. In Avicenna's cosmology, there is a distinction between the sensory material world and the world of celestial souls, which possess active imagination and true representation of the universe. The earth is projected by the soul is the earth of Harkalia, a pure reflection of the soul's own image. This universe is called the world of archetypal images and serves as a mediator between the sensory and intelligible worlds. The book in this specific chapter discusses the concept of an intermediate universe or the eighth climate between the sensory and intelligible universes. It is a world of light and imagination symbolizing both corporeal and intelligible substances. This universe is the realm of visionary events and spiritual experiences that cannot be governed by sensory perceptions or rational consciousness. It is described by the various spiritual traditions, such as Suhravardi's philosophy of, of ancient Persia and the Sheikhism school in Iran. The earth of Harkalia within this intermediate universe contains archetypal images of beings and things in the sensory world. This world, also called the Berzak, serves as the real place for psycho-spiritual events and is impenetrable by sensory organs. The book further elaborates on the idea, ideal topography of Harkalia and how it con conjoins time and eternity, space and transpense. The Sheikhism community believes that the, history, that the history and hierarchy of beings ends in our terrestrial earth, which acts as a tomb for them from which they must emerge and be resurrected through the understanding of the true sense of the descent of eternal forms. Epiphany and the idea of mirror are used to explain this concept of perception. The book discusses the concept of the eighth climate, which refers to the world of absolute psychic activity, that is above sensory perception, but below the soul. This world acts as a berzak or interval between the sensory world and the soul. It emphasizes that physical matter is only a vehicle or a epiphanic place for the forms produced by the activity of the soul. To perceive the absolute reality of these forms, one must have an eye of the world beyond or organ of vision that corresponds to the imagination. The mystical earth of Herkalia represents the earth in its absolute state, detached from empirical appearance, where all realities exist as archetypal images, mediate, meditated by the soul.
It is a place where the soul contemplates itself and its energies, powers, hopes, and fears. This earth is also seen as the place of div divine epiphanies, where the soul is at home and its archetypal images become transparent. It is the earth of visions and resurrection. A spiritual experience is detailed by Sohrawardi, where he has a dialogue with Aristotle in an intermediate state between waking and sleeping. Hermes is also described as having a visionary experience of ascending to the heavens. These experiences show the transmutation of the soul and the existence of an intermediary world. The ontological status of this world is discussed, noting its importance in visionary recitals, dreams, and prophetic revelations. It is described as a mode of being in suspense where images and forms are independent of a substratum. The active imagination is seen as a, 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 like an epiphany a place for these images. The book discusses the concept of the earth of Herkalia and its relation, relation to the spiritual experiences and perceptions. It explains that there is a universe of correspondences in the image of the physical world that does not depend solely on the physics but also integrates psycho-spiritual activity. The book also mentions the significance of living in the earth of Herkalia and the expectation of the Imam's epiphany. It highlights the idea that history and events are seen as visions in the earth of Herkalia rather than purely factual or historical. Additionally, the book presents a doctrine that distinguishes between different bodies and their relation to the soul. Further, the discussion is there on the concept of the subtle body and its role in eschatology, according to Shakyism. It explains that there are two aspects of the subtle body, one that is imperishable and another one that is temporary. The imperishable body corresponds to the eternal soul and is wrapped within the temporary body. The book also mentions the concept of resurrection and how the earth of Herkalia plays a role in individual and general eschatology. In the mystical belief system of Shakyism, there is a concept of a hidden, imperishable body called Jasad or Kaliyi that exists alongside the earthly body. This Jasad or Kaliyi is said to survive in the grave and is only visible to the visionary imagination. The Shakyis believe in the resurrection of bodies and see alchemy as a way to perceive and transmute the earthly elements into subtle elements of the mystical earth of Herkalia. The alchemical operation is seen as a mirror through which the wise contemplate the resurrection of both bodies and spirits. And the final result is a coincidenta appositorium where the body becomes a solidified liquid. This med meditation on alchemical themes allows for the interiorization of the alchemical work. Through alchemical operations, certain substances such as diamond and pewter can be transformed into different materials. These transformations symbolize the spiritual bodies that believers will have in paradise. The meditation on these transformations leads to the creation of a spiritual body, which can perceive celestial thoughts and forms. This spiritual body is made from the original clay of celestial cities and receives the influence from the heavens of Herkalia. This celestial earth is a reflection of the inner states and actions of individuals. The celestial bodies are the forms of love and represent the totality of the human being. The idea of the celestial body is connected to personal divinity. The concepts of Herkalia has similarities to the paradise of archetypes in other religions and spiritual traditions. The encounter with the celestial image brings joy and happiness to the soul. The book discusses the concept of the celestial earth and its connection to the spiritual and philosophical teachings. And it introduces the concept of the celestial earth as the ultimate destination for individuals and explores the works of various Islamic scholars and authors who have written about this topic. Moving further, the book discusses the founder of Shaykhism school, Sheikh Ahmad al Hasai, and his successors. It also mentions the spiritual works and scientific productivity of these individuals. The book alludes to a conversation about the problem of knowledge and suggests that the further understanding can be found in Suhrawardi's book of Oriental Philosophy. Hermes is in a temple praying when he sees an earth about to be engulfed and cities falling into the abyss. 
He calls for help and is told to climb up to the higher realms. He does so and sees an earth and heavens beneath him. This symbolizes the ascent of the soul and leaving behind the material world. Ibn Kamilna suggests that the symbols represent the body, material attachments, and the higher spiritual world. Korban in this book continues to discuss the manifestation of light in mystical experiences, which can take on various forms, such as human form, constellations, statues, and artworks. The book mentions that the peripatics lack knowledge of these experiences and overlook certain aspects of philosophy. The book also explains that mystics who have attained mystical experience can manifest themselves in different forms and have the power to influence and act. The importance of the light and its effect on the soul are highlighted, including its ability to bring joy, awaken inclination, and bring prosperity. The book also briefly discusses the ability of mystics to walk on water, glide through air, and reach heaven. And the chapter concludes by explaining how these experiences are related to the eighth climate and the world of archetypal images and forms. Imaginative forms exist in a separate realm called the world of the archetypal image and the imaginative perception. These forms are neither in thought nor in concrete reality, but they have real being and exist in an intermediate world between the world of the intelligence and the world of the senses. This world contains all forms and figures, dimensions, and bodies, and is where the totality of forms in the higher world have their counterpart in their lower world. The existence of these autonomous imaginative forms have been affirmed by ancient sages, and they are separate substances, independent of material matters. They exist in the meditative faculty in the soul's active imagination, and are not imminent in a substratum. The world of the archetypal image and imaginative perception is where divine apparitions and the resurrection of bodies occur. The book discusses various manifestations of divine entities and the perception of these manifestations. It explores the concept of the subtle body and its connection to the material body. Additionally, it also mentions the existence of sounds and melodies in the celestial spheres. And the chapter concludes by mentioning Ibn Arabi's chapter, on the earth created from the clay of Adam and its symbolic significance. The palm tree is a symbol in various religious texts and is linked to the birth of Jesus under a palm tree in the Quran. According to theology, the palm tree is created from the surplus clay used to make Adam and is like an aunt to the humans. This earth created from the remainder of the palm tree, tree's clay contains the entire universe within it. Mystics can enter this earth through their spirit and experience visions and revelations. The earth is inhabited by living beings that speak and have their own universe. Access to this earth requires mystical gnosis and withdrawal from the physical body, and those who enter are guided by forms who show them around and allow them to communicate with their surroundings. And the book shows the example of Ibn Arabi's teachings where he discusses the concept of a parallel earth where knowledge of God is increased. He shares stories of individuals who have experienced this earth and describes its wonders and customs. He also explains the connection between this earth and our own and how our souls are transported there during sleep and after death. The, this specific chapter concludes by mentioning that this earth is connected to both paradise and our earthly earth. The luminous body emits lines of light that form a network stretching to the observer's eyes. This network represents the forms of subtle bodies that transport souls to paradise during sleep. The observer's intention to see the lights of light, lines of light representing visionary apperception, the retraction of the lines of light back into the luminous body represents the end of perception. The Mundus Archetypus is a spiritual universe of pure light that contains the forms of everything in the material world. Each being in the material world has a captive archetypal form perceived in the human imagination. Mystics who reach absolute Mundus Archetypus discover reality as it truly is and may have their eternal individuality revealed. The Berzak that spirits experience after leaving the earthly world 
is different from the Burzak that separates spiritual entities from the world of bodies. The book discusses the concept of descent and the ascent in the spiritual world, specifically in relation to the Burzak, the realm between death and the day of judgment. Korban highlights the difference between the forms in the first and second Burzak, with the latter being inaccessible except on the day of judgment. Korban also emphasizes the importance of imagination in understanding the universe and attaining spiritual knowledge. And the book mentions the significance of Al-Araf, a place of recognition and knowledge in the afterlife. Moving forward, the discussion is there on the concept of imagination as the principle of source of all universes, with the imagination being the essence in which the perception of the divine being is revealed. It mentions the idea that all inhabitants, inhabitants of the universe or the, all of the universes are in a state of sleep, except for those that are in Al-Araf and the region of the dunes, who are in reciprocal comprehense with God. So it all, if you've seen the movie Dune, it should show you like a little bit of a <laughs> similar experience here. Additionally, the book includes a story of a stranger journeying to the country of Taij and conversing with Kither, al Kither. A person finds themselves in the presence of a personage with white hair who tells them that they must wear magnificent garments and be perfumed in order to access the world of mystery. They learn that the garments can be found in the market of sesame left over from the clay of Adam and the perfumes can be obtained on the earth on the earth of the imagination. The person then travels to the earth of perfection and meets a personage who introduces them to the world of mystery. They learn about the city and its inhabitants and have a conversation with the leader, Kither. They discuss the leader's sublime situation and the distinctive sign of those who reach him. The book discusses the category of the men of the invisible in the cities of Jabalka and Jabarila. These men are described as spiritual entities and are categorized based on their rank and abilities. Jabalka is seen as the interworld between the supersensory and the sensory worlds, while Jabarila is the world of the afterlife. The two interworlds are different and contain the forms and images of the universe. Jabalka holds all the archetypes while Jabarila contains the forms of completed works and moral behavior. Both interworlds are spiritual universes and have light as substance. The book discusses the concept of Orient and Occident in relation to different worlds and levels of existence. It emphasizes that all perceptions and realities are inseparable from human existence and exist within oneself. The book also explores the nature of bodies in the world beyond, stating that they are animated and created by the souls themselves. Further into the reading, it is explained that finite dimensions and material spatializations of this world are not valid for the other world. Each, each human being possesses a complete universe within them, and the dimensions of one's, one person's universe do not align with those of another. Acts and intentions assume different forms in the soul's dwelling, dwelling and each form has a specific mode of existence and appearance. Anger and knowledge are provided as examples of how different forms can have different configurations in their modes of existing and appearing. Actions in this world are the source of behavior, while souls are the principles of bodies in the world beyond. The human soul itself is the matter that cons constitutes bodies in the other world and can receive forms in a subtle supersensory state. Material matter, in contrast, is dense and opaque and receives densified forms determined by sensory dimensions. The soul is both receptive and active in receiving and producing forms. Receptive in the other world is not progressively, progressively acquired or potential. Lastly, the book mentions a school of philosophers who believe that ancient Persian kings and Greek sages were initiates of Oriental Theosophy while Aristotle held an opposing position. Oriental Theosophists and Peripatetic Philosophers have different approaches to philosophy and mystical Theosophy. The former emphasize spiritual realization and mystical experience, while the latter prioritize rational theory and logical reasoning. 
The Orientals believe in the existence of an intermediate universe between the immaterial intelligible world and the material sensory world, where archetypal images exist objectively. Objectively, this universe allows for the manifestation of beings in the material world through epiphanic epiphany places like mirrors and human imagination. The Orientals also believe in a universe called the Mundus Archetypus, where bodily resurrection, paradise, hell, and the earth of resurrection exist. The peripatetics and scholastic theologians object to those ideas based on their understanding of divisibility and matter. The Orientals argue that a primordial immaterial matter is necessary for the cosmogony of the beings in the Mundus Archetypus. This world acts as an intermediary between the world of spirits and the world of bodies, allowing for the connection and the interaction between the two. The archetypal world is both spiritual and material, embodying characteristics of both pure intelligible substance and material substance. Further, the discussion is there on the concept of the intermediate universe, which serves as a connection between the intelligible and sensory worlds. This specific universe, described as an immense world, is where spiritual entities are corporealized and bodies are spiritualized. It is through this world that epiphanic forms and archetypal images are manifested. The book mentions the possibility of events such as the descent of Jesus and the resurrection, which are believed to occur in the intermediate world. And to further go on, the book dwells into the intricate relation relationship between the physical and spiritual realms and the various manifestations within them. Astronomers commonly deal with the term jism as an undefined body that can be divided into three dimensions. <clears throat> it can refer to an intermediate and simple body, matter with the capacity to receive forms, or a mathematical solid body. In the tradition of the imams, both jasad and jism are used sometimes interchangeably. Humans possess two types of jasad and jism, with the first being a terrestrial body of flesh that is subject to time and has no connection to a person's identities or qualities. The second type is a spiritual body that survives after the terrestrial body dissolves, but is invisible to the earthly beings due to the op opacity of their fleshly eyes. God brings creatures back to life, causing rain from the ocean below the throne, referred to in the Quran. The earth becomes a single ocean where a universal refining process takes place. The members of each individual spiritual body join together to form an organism in perfect shape. When the trumpet vibrates, the, earth, the spirits of the earth burst out of the tomb and return to their spiritual bodies. These spiritual bodies belong to earth and are the bodies in which humans are resurrected. The present body of flesh is not resurrected but entirely purified. The bodies of the holy imams have been take, taken up to heaven and refer to the separation from terrestrial bodies. The two types of bodies, astral and super celestial, separate at death and are united during resurrection. The spirits are resuscitated in their purified super celestial bodies. The spiritual body belonging to the world of Hurkalia does not undergo a change in weight during purification. The book discusses the concept of purification and change in relation to the body and the tomb. It explains that while the physical body remains the same, it is also different after undergoing purification. Korban also dwells into the esoteric meaning of the tomb and its significance in relation to the person's nature and desire. And further, it explores the concept of the world of Hurkalia, describing it as an intermediate world between the material world and the world of souls. The book also mentions the different regions and elements within Hurkalia. Further, the discussion is there on the existence of a universe called the Earthly Paradise in the western part, where faithful believers take refuge. The existence of this universe is supported by theological traditions, verses from the Quran and philosophical understanding. The book also explains the concept of different bodies that make up the human being and how they relate to the afterlife. The material body and astral body do not return after death, while the spiritual body does. 
These bodies are not essential part of the human being and are considered temporary accidents. The book also uses metaphors to explain this concept, and you'll see that when you read it for yourself. Further, the book discusses the survival of the quote-unquote I spirit and its return to the six treasuries before being reabsorbed into the trumpet. It also mentions the proofs of this concept and the composition of the essential body. The spiritual body is hidden within the elemental body and survives after death. The essential body, composed of a materia prima and the archetypal form, remains with the spirit until the second blast of the trumpet. The book also mentions and explains the return of the vegetable and animal souls to their sources after death. Further, the nature of the spirit and its relationship with the body is discussed also in this book. It explains that the spirit is always connected to its original body and only leaves its temporary only leaves it temporarily during certain events. The book also explores the symbolism of different materials and their homologies to the spiritual and astral bodies. The commentary of Korban analyzes the ideas presented by Muli and Mulili and offering an impartial critique. So he he does like a little cross comparison here and adds commentary in this specific part of the book. Further, the book discusses the relationship between the resurrection of bodies and the theosophical thought. It argues that the second aspect, the resurrection of bodies, is not as evidenced as the first aspect. Korban also mentions the practice of Tawil, which is an interpretation of spiritual meaning and its connection to the alchemical operation of hiding apparent and manifesting the hidden. Corban goes on to discuss the evidence for the res resurrection of bodies using philosophical understanding and the concept of spirits returning to their original world. And Corban mentions the difference between the soul as a subtle organism and a material matter as, a, as dense a, and, and, and opaque matter. Corban disagrees with the idea that paradise consists only of pure psychic forms and argues that the perception of matter as dense and dark is not correct. And going further, Corban discusses how bodies in the world beyond our world can have dimensions and positions without density or opacity. Those who live in paradise in their spiritual flesh are the same people who lived in this world, but they have been purified and freed from darkness and destruction. They perceive spiritual realities and can will their bodies to become spirits. There is a similarity between this spiritual transformation and the process of alchemy where materials are dissolved and coagulated multiple times to create a spiritual living mineral substance. This substance can bring dead metals to life and its power increases with each dissolution and coagulation. This process is only possible with spirits and not with inert material bodies. The same principle applies to imaginative forms which are created solely by the will and the intention of the imaginative consciousness and do not require a material substratum to exist. So basically solve and dissolve. Uh, going further, the book discusses the idea that imaginative forms are contained within the heart and are known by God as he created them. Korban mentions that these forms belong to the world of the Malakut and are brought down by angels. The power of imagination is said to exist independently of the material body and is compared to the soul. Korban also talks about the two jasad and jism in relation to the body's composition and resurrection. Further, Korban discusses the concept of the human body and its different forms in different realms. It mentions, this book specifically mentions that the first jasad, elemental body, is an accident of the lower elements while the first jism, the astral body, is an accident of the intermediate world. The I spirit is different from both of these bodies and survives in the berzak in full consciousness. Korban also explains the process of the I spirit reabsorbing into, the, into its matrix through the sounding of Seraphiel's trumpet. And this specific part of the book concludes by discussing the concept of form and matter stating that in the matter that returns and assumes forms rather than the form itself. When someone dies and is resurrected, their form is determined by their actions and beliefs. If they live a virtuous life and have a genuine faith, their form will be human. 
However, if they follow evil passions and betray their pact, their form will be that of a beast. The human form corresponds to the divine will and, and, and is the object of divine love. By following the prophet and modeling their actions after his, individuals can become beloved by God. And that's why they stress in a Sufi path is you have to follow the example of the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The faithful believer's body is their own paradise, while the body of the ungodly is their own hell. The size of the believer's paradise is determined by their knowledge, spiritual consciousness, and moral conduct. This, the archetypal body of the believer is their paradise, and the archetypal body of the impious is their hell. Like the Persian poet Omar Khayyam said that I myself am heaven and hell. That's what Korban is teaching you here as well. Each person receives what they are capable of receiving based on their faith or faithlessness. Paradise has eight degrees and Jahannam has seven. Each corresponding, then Jahannam meaning hell. Each corresponding to different levels of spiritual rank. Further, the book explains that human beings have two dimensions. A dimension of light and a dimension of darkness. The dimension of light represents goodness and closeness to the divine, while the dimension of darkness represents evil and distance from the divine. The book also discusses the different levels or degrees within these dimensions, with paradise having eight degrees and hell having seven. Each level represents different aspects of a human being's being, such as intellect, imagination, and spirit. And this part of the book goes on to mention that actions and works in this world are manifested in different forms in the other world, depending on their nature. There are seven categories of earth that correspond to the seven categories of heaven. The eighth heaven called Kursi is not part of the heavens, but rather a threshold of the invisible, such as the, if you read the verse Ayatul Kursi in the Quran, it explains a part of this. The universe of the heavens and the earth correspond to the human soul. And different individuals have different levels of perception. Different individuals also have different uh, spiritual dwelling places according to their works. Works and actions are gathered in the respective heaven and will be manifested on the resurrection day. The degree of paradise corresponds to the respective capacity and conduct of each individual. The eighth degree belongs to the prophets and imams with no opposing counterpart, counterpart. The book discusses the degrees of refuge and gardens of the abode of peace, as well as the different degrees of hell. The book also presents the idea of a world with a vertical axis of history rather than a horizontal evolution. The ascent and descent of intelligence are described, along with the concept of reaching a higher spiritual level to see the hidden imam. This specific chapter concludes by warning about the effects of these spiritual ideas on individuals with weak and deformed nature. The book and Korban continue to discuss the concept of Harkalia, which refers to the divine creation beyond our, beyond our visible eyes and visible world. It explains that there are multiple universes and describes the world of the imperative and the world of the intelligence. All creatures are forms of the intelligence and fulfill a doxological and liturgical function and the emphasis is there of the interconnectedness of matter and form. Further, the discussion of the world of the soul, which is also refer referred to as the world of forms and figures, the world of eon and the world of the intellect is also described in this book. It explains that this world is separate from the impurities and the vices of our current world. And it also mentions the world of the spirit, which is an intermediary between the world of the intellect and the world of the soul. It emphasizes that the souls in this world are autonomous and have no connection to the corruptible matters of our world. And going further, the aspect of what Korban is saying criticizes the belief that human souls are associated with corporeal matters and argues that the reality of a body is not limited to the physical bodies of our world. Further, Korban discusses the existence of separate images and forms that are projected into mirrors and emphasizes that these images have their own existence and are not derived from the mirror itself. It also discusses the concept of death in relation to the different worlds and universes 
and it, it concludes by going on further by explaining how eternal forms come into the surf surface of the accidental matters of the world. Fire manifests its characteristics way of being when it reaches the surface of temporal matter and begins to glow. It spreads and extends based on its force and the type of matter it feeds on. Colors, on the other hand, lack the ability to spread and penetrate beyond their initial point as they are weak and deficient. The human soul is considered one of the most mag magnificent and perfect eternal forms, bearing witness to the divine being and possessing multiple energies. The interworld, or berzak, exists independently of our material universe and corresponds to it with its own concrete state and being. It is sustained by the eternal soul and reflects the divine treasuries. It is possible that there are forms of other, another world that can only be seen by those with better sight. These forms may not always be manifested on the surface of physical matter. Their existence does not depend on temporary mirrors or physical objects. The first imam and other narrations in the traditional accounts mention communication with spirits and the existence of the jinni or angels, jinns and angels. The Quran and trustworthy informants attest to the existence of these beings. The world of the archetypal images known as the Mundus Archetypus or Barzakh contains animals, plants, elements, oceans, continents, cities, paradise, and hell. This world exists on a lower level of the Mundus Archetypus and is described in the Surah of the Cave in the Holy Quran. Traditional accounts provide further details about the inhabitants, religions, knowledge, beliefs, and practices of the people in this universe. The testimony of the very pure Imams is recognized as divine by these people. Although the details of this universe are not fully known, it is important to accept what has been said about it, about it by learned individuals. There are multiple cities beyond the West and the East inhabited by devout people who have an unwavering devotion to God and the members of the family of God's messenger, the Ahlul Bayt. These cities have gates, languages, and intense spiritual practices. The inhabitants of these cities are invulnerable and possess powerful weapons. They only attack people of other religions to convert them to Islam. These universes exist alongside our material universe but with no deterioration and external existence and in eternal existence unbelievers cannot become faithful and vice versa and the interworlds have a different nature than our world the imam will reign for 50,000 years and the imams and their followers are always connected the epiphany of the imam occurs when humans open their eyes to the world of the harkalia and see the imam's royal majesty the imam is already invested with the imamit but cannot be perceived by our senses. The presence of the Imam, spiritual leader, is like the presence of jo Joseph among his brothers, where they did not recognize him until he made himself known. Similarly, we do not recognize the Imam until we have the capacity for spiritual consciousness. The Imamit and the prophetic message belong to the Imam, and when we open our spiritual eye and awaken our senses, we can see what the visible realm is. We can see that the visible realm is in reality his realm the imam's existence is like a primordial image that covers the entire horizon by turning away from the earthly world and focusing on the archetypal image we can perceive the world of Herkalia and understand that the imam governs and decides everything it is challenging for non-gnostic individuals to perceive these hidden me meanings and messages <laughs> further the book discusses various concepts related to Mazdianism, including the translation of Mazdian concepts, the role of angel gods, and their connection to divine splendor. The Imagiotariae, etymology of the word Fraverti, and the identification of Zavarna with the soul. It also mentions the presence of an invisible church in Mazdianism and the method of representation in the form of a wheel. The book and Korban discusses the use of a Buddhist diagram as a plan of a terrestrial division similar to a mandala. It also mentions the Iranian garden which symbolizes the earth and Korban also explores the idea of a feminine divinity in Mazdian religious feeling and discusses the concept of a celestial earth. Additionally, it mentions the Hierophanes, 
Hierophanes of the goddess Erdvi Sura and describes various trees and mountains in Iranian mythology. Korban further discusses the association of Mount Victoria with various religions and mythical figures, such as Zarathustra and King Gondopharis. And it mentions that the significance of the mountain in Christian and Zoroastrian for prophecies and suggests a possible connection between Persian paintings and Zoroastrian artwork. Korban also touches on the symbolism of flowers in Zoroastrian liturgy and the metaphors used to describe the appearance of the archangel. The book discusses various references to Zarathustra and his encounters with divine figures in different locations. And Korban also mentions the significance of the spenta or meti and the concept of wisdom. Further, the dis discussion is there on the distinction between the inner self and religion and the meaning of the word to see in religious context. And Korban also mentions the importance of translating religious terms accurately and explores the concept of a mystical, mystical physiology in Mazdaism. Additionally, it referenced these, references the similarities between Mazdian and Manakian representations of religious figures. Overall, this chapter, as we head towards the conclusion of the book, emphasizes the need for a, like a phenomenological approach to in interpreting Mazdaism. Moving further, Korban discusses various concepts in the philosophy of Suhrvardi, including the role of Arshtit in activating the energy of Zavarna and the significance of the number 40 in spiritual practice. Korban also references the sacred mythical meaning of a custom in ancient Persia and the symbolism of the androgyny. Further, the book mentions the mystical earth of Horkalia and the concept of undifferentiation. Going further, Korban discusses the world of archetypal images and the function of imagination in the perception of a mystic named Mir Sayyid al-Hamadani. And the book mentions the location of a sheikh, sheikhi community in Kerman, Iran, and the existence of an intermediate universe called the Mundus Archetypa. Additionally, the book suggests the need for a term like imaginal to describe this intermediate universe and discusses the interplay between the sensory and supersensory realms. As we head into the conclusion of this book, Korban discusses the representation of mystical experiences by Suhrvardi using the sacred light as the agent of ecstasy. Korban mentions the importance of Iranian avicennicism av 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 and the existence of anime coletes, colestes. Korban refers to the concept of the fourfold body and compares it to the doctrine of Rudolf Steiner. And Korban explores the relationship between the soul and its vehicle and discusses the preservation of the archetypal body and the hearth of Horkalia. Further, Korban mentions the works on alchemy by Sheikh Ahmad and its successors, as well as the importance of imagination in the alchemical work. Going further, Korban discusses the existence of spirit in minerals and perception of celestial spheres. And he mentions the paradise of Adam, which can only be perceived by pure imagination. The book includes references to alchemy and the relationship between spirituality and esotericism. Now, Korban goes back to the world of Horkalia, where in the world of Horkalia, knowledge of self as an orient, like an orient presence, leads to an entrance into the earth of visions and the earth of resurrection. The book includes references to Manakian eschatology and the bursting forth of the moon. And... <clears throat> Korban provides insights into the interpretation of concepts, such as the witness of contemplation and the philosophy of Avicenna. And the book further emphasizes the solar character of the royal Zaverna and discusses the world of subtle bodies and the distinction between elements and heavens. Berzak is understood in terms of both body and extent, and the authors mention the importance of personal testimonies in supporting their claims. The seven planets and their symbolic colors are also mentioned. The book concludes by discussing Adam as the Imam of mankind. And as we head further into the conclusion, the book discusses various mentions and interpretations of the palm tree symbol in religious and philosophical contexts. 
particularly in Islamic theology. It touches on the symbology of the palm tree as representing the celestial earth of light and its connections to figures such as Maryam and the Imams. The book also mentions the distinctions between different worlds and levels of being and the significance of imaginative perception. Further, the discussion is there by Korban on the various concepts related to the watcher, including the reciprocal co-naturalization of what is shown and to whom it is shown, as well as the idea of being in the present, of this, uh, com like, of this presence. There are mentions of Avicenna's mystical novel, the concept of egregores, egregores, and various Gnostic themes. And the book also alludes to the importance of the earth of sesame and its connection to man and references the prophet Kither and the secrets of the philosophical alphabet. Further, it meant also mentions the hierarchy of invisible ones symbolized by receptacles, vases, and the four altid. And it goes to further discuss the various topics related to Sufism, Islamic eschatology, philosophy, and it, sh it shows the different conversations with apparitions, Quranic verses, distinctions between different planes of existence and different theories of existence as Korban goes into in-depth detail about all of that in this book. The significance of Hurkalia, the spiritual body and pilgrimage is also concluded in the final section of this book. The book references various authors and their works in the field of Sufism and Islamic philosophy. And going further, Korban discusses various aspects of Sheikh Ahmad Asai's work on Shia theosophy, including the twofold qual and the twofold jiam, the function of the active imagination and the relationship between the physical body and the spiritual body. Korban also references other works and scholars in order to provide further context and understanding. And you have to read this book truly to un understand it. The book also discusses the concept of the resurrection body, which is divided into the esoteric part of the vegetable soul and the vital or animal soul. And it also mentions the significance of the number 400 in relation to the cosmic pause and the maturation of resurrection. Korban further mentions the connection between alchemy and spiritual uh, hermetics, as well as a comparison of data with works by Jung and Iliad. Korban references the work of Sheikh Ahmad Ahmad and discusses the alchemical operation and the homologation of philosophers and theologians. And he also examines the connection between alchemical ideas and Shiite esotericism. The concept of coincidenta oppositorum and the importance of the imagination of the resurrection body are discussed. Korban also touches on the symbol symbolism of the tomb and the objections of literalist orthodoxy to the shakis. And Korban mentions the duality of form in the jasad and the astral body's connection to the eye spirit. And as we head into the conclusion, Korban refers to the pre-existence of souls and the work of Sheikh Hajj Muhammad Karim Khan Kirmani on the doctrine of resurrection bodies. Korban discusses various concepts related to Mazdian eschatology, Shiite piety, piety, and mystical theosophy. And it touches on the topics such as the resurrection body, the concept of Himma, the meaning of Shirk, the distinction between active imagination and fantasy, astral symbolism, and the role of the hidden imam. Korban also refer refers to the intelligence, cosmic liturgy, lit liturgy, and the pleroma of the 14 very pure. And the book concludes with a discussion of Herkalia, the relationship between the hidden imam and his companions and the inhabitants of the war of Yima. Korban, in his conclusion, discusses various works and references related to Shia Islam, including descriptions of inner states, comparisons with Swedenborg's descriptions and traditions about Jabalki and Jabala. And Korban also mentions the importance of esotericism in faith and Shia beliefs, as well as the symbolism and spiritual significance of certain numbers and figures. So I hope... As I concluded the summary teaching of this book, Spiritual Body and Celestial Earth from Masdi in Iran to Shiite Iran by Henry Korban, I hope you were able to benefit from this. And um, I tell you, this is a heavy, heavy read. 
and you got to be a adept or initiate of a certain level to be able to truly understand this book but i hope i was able to sum it up for you in layman terms and you were able to get a better understanding of this book and again this is highly stressed for those not only on the sufi path but any initiatic path or order as we honor do this in the honor of henry corbon's memory so much love to all of you in the month of April 2024. Assalamu alaikum.